Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining this talk called Property Wrappers or How Swift Decided to Become Java. So I'm Vincent in French, and uh, I'm currently in France right now, as this year the conference is a remote conference. And as you can guess, the focus of this talk is going to be property wrappers. But first, let's take a look at what's happening outside iOS. Let's take a look at some Android code. So this is some Android code that uses Kotlin as a language, and it's a call that performs a network call. So the only thing you need to know in order to understand my point, if you're not familiar with Kotlin, is to know that what Kotlin calls an interface, it's what Swift calls a protocol. With that in mind, you're all set. So this code implements a service, and this service performs a network, calls, a network call. And as we can see, the function that will trigger a network call it's annotated with a lot of things. For instance, there is this add form URL encoded annotation that tells how the payload must be encoded. There is add post that says which HTTP method should be used along with the path to the endpoint that we are querying. Then the function itself, it takes arguments and these arguments, they are annotated. One is annotated by something that says it's a header and it gives the key to encode the header. And then there are arguments which are annotated to say that there are fields and there is also the key to be used in order to encode them inside the payload of the request. And the very interesting thing to know is that this is actually the entire implementation for a network call. There is no implementation as we would traditionally understand, meaning that there is no code to implement the function. That is because with the knowledge inside the annotation, the compiler, the Kotlin compiler, is able to synthesize the code needed to perform the call. So this annotation, when we see it, we think that, yeah, that's a very powerful concept because through this annotation, Kotlin developers, they have the possibility to annotate their code and this annotation, they carry a meaning that is going to enrich the behavior of an existing code. And it lets developers extend their code and add functionality in a very declarative way and uh, as we've seen with Swift Evolution, a declarative way is something that we really want because it has a lot of desirable qualities for our code base, such as readability, easy to maintain, etc. Unfortunately for us Swift developers, we didn't have this kind of annotation, this nice annotation. But something changed recently. So last year, during WWC 2019, a new framework was introduced called Swift UI. And when they showed the first code snippet, that use Swift UI, you might have been intrigued by this add state. Because if you were familiar with Swift, you had never seen it before, and you were like, hmm, what is it? And it turned out when they released the Xcode beta a few hours later, that it was actually the use of a new construct of Swift, introduced with Swift 5.1, which is called a property wrapper. So in this very simple Swift UI view that only displays a text, the model, which is a name, is annotated with this add state. And this add state is a property wrapper. And the property wrapper is something that is going to decorate a property with a custom behavior. So it sounds similar to the annotation in Kotlin in Java, with a very interesting difference is that property wrappers, as the name suggests, they only apply to properties. So it's much more focused than annotations in Kotlin, because we saw that annotations, they apply to functions, to arguments here. It only applies to properties, but still, we'll see that we will be able to implement some interesting thing with them. And to understand how they work, actually, the best way to start is to just have a look at the Swift evolution proposal where they were initially pitched. So we are going to have a look at the introduction of this proposal because it gives us a lot of insight in what motivated the addition and what they can bring to the language. So I'm quoting, it says, there are property implementation patterns that come up repeatedly, meaning when writing apps or frameworks. And rather than hard code a fixed set of patterns into the compiler, as we have done for lazy and NS copying, we should provide a general property wrapper mechanism to allow this pattern to be defined as libraries. So the idea is to empower developers by giving them the tool to implement their own wrappers that will let them add a specific behavior 
to a property. And there were some attributes in Swift that did this. So the example are lazy and NS copying, but these, they had the, the limitation of being hard coded into the compiler. This time, you no longer need to touch the compiler in order to create a wrapper. You can do it in Swift itself, as we are going to see. So we are going to implement some property wrappers with examples that come of the very nice article of NSHipster on the topic. So the first one is we are going to implement a simple business requirement. It's clamping a numerical value. So we are going to imagine that we are working on an app that deals with chemical solutions. And chemical solutions, they have this attribute called the pH, which measures the acidity of a solution. And it has this interesting property that it must be a numerical value between 0 and 14. It doesn't make sense for it to be below 0 or above 13. And we will implement this requirement with a wrapper called add clamping. So how could we implement it? We begin pretty simple by implementing a struct, so something we are very familiar with in Swift. This struct has a generic argument, so it's the value. The only requirement on it is that it must be comparable. And then inside the state of the struct, we store a value. So it's a var, meaning that it will change over the lifetime of the value. And there is the range, a let constant, which is the interval inside which the value must always lie. Then we implement an init. So pretty simple. There is the value and the range. We do a precondition because if the value is outside the range, at initialization time, we want to treat it as a developer error, and then we do some member-wise initialization. And then we are actually going to turn this into a property wrapper. So to do so, pretty simple, we just add this add property wrapper attribute before the struct, and then the compiler will know it must treat this struct as a property wrapper. So when we try to build, we will now get an error saying we need to implement something called a wrap value. So let's do it. So pretty simple. This wrap value is actually a computed property. So it has the same syntax as a pro computed property, as we would expect, so a name and a type. And then we implement a getter, so simple. We just return the value. And then the setter. And it's inside the setter that we implement the logic of clamping the new value to the bounds of the interval. And that's it. We've implemented a property wrapper, so a first property wrapper, so you can see it's pretty simple and you do it in Swift itself with using concepts that we are familiar with, such as struct. And then we can use it, so now we can write this solution struct, the code we now compile because add clamping is a property wrapper that is available since we've just implemented it. We can use a solution in our code, and then if at some point we were to set a value for its pH that lies outside the interval, then our setter will be executed and the value will be clamped to the interval as we have implemented it. So when we try to retrieve it, it would we would actually retrieve the value zero because we tried to set a value below the lower bound. So we are actually retrieving the value of the lower bound. So it feels a little bit like uh, like magic when we use property wrapper for the first time, but it's actually not some kind of real magic. It's just some standard compiler magic, and we are going to understand it very easily. So what you need to understand is that when you write solution.ph, the compiler is actually going to replace it by value, And this is what makes property wrapper so seamless to use, is that basically, they are just, uh, when you use a property wrapper, the compiler is going to add the missing part that makes you use the computed property that you implemented in your wrapper and where you implemented all your business logic for your wrapper. So when you are using the property as any other property, the compiler behind the scenes is adding the little bit that makes it actually go through all the logic implemented inside the wrapper. So the nice thing is that it makes it a very seamless mechanism. And there is also an added bonus is that since all of these things happen at compile time, there is no minimum OS requirement to use property wrappers. You, you can use property wrappers on any version of iOS as long as you are building your app with the Swift 5.1 or above, a uh, Swift 5.1 or above version of the Swift compiler. So that's pretty cool. And as you can see, the initializer also gets some compiler magic because by initializer, 
had two arguments, but uh, when I used my wrapper, I only provided one, and it's because by, conve by convention, the argument what value will be set using the initial value of the property. So this way we can use the assign assignation that we are very used to using when we want to give an initial value to a property. We can use this syntax and the compiler will retrieve the value and give it to the initializer. This way it makes it much more seamless and uh, natural to use wrappers. So as we've seen, uh, the compiler does some magic and when we access the property, we are actually accessing the what value of the property. So what should we do if we want to manipulate not the the value inside the wrapper, but the wrapper itself. So we can do it by implementing something called a projected value. So it's just like the wrap value, it's a computed property, except that this one is optional, you don't need it to make a wrapper. But here I am implementing it by just returning self, and then if I want to access the wrapper and not the value, I would do so by prefixing the property with a dollar sign. So if I do solution dot dollar ph, what it will return will be of type clamping double, so the wrapper, and not of type just double as I would have gotten if I had done solution.ph. So we've implemented one wrapper for numerical values, but we could think of a lot of user useful use cases that could be implemented with wrappers in an application that deals heavily with numerical values. So things like normalizing values, rounding values, truncating values, quantizing values, etc. We can see that there are already a lot of use cases. But we can also find use cases outside of very numerical application. So we are going to take a look at trimming characters. So in our apps, we often use the string type a lot because it's a very versatile type. But often these strings, they store data that must obey standardized formats and white spaces can be very tricky with these formats. So consider, for instance, this URL where there is a leading white space, it actually won't be able to be correctly parsed and it will return nil, even though there is a correct URL after the leading white space. Same thing for dates. And it can result in some very um, tricky issues because it's very easy to forget, to check, to remove these white spaces. So let's implement a property wrapper that will do all this trimming logic. So it's actually pretty simple to implement. So just as we've seen before, we use the add property wrapper attribute. We use a struct called trimmed. Inside the struct, we are going to store a value. We implement a wrap value. So the getter is just returning the value. And in the setter, just as before we had implemented the clamping logic, here we are implementing the trimming logic in the setter. And then we have an init. And that's it, we have implemented this new wrapper and we can use it. So let's say we are working on an application that manages blog posts. So this post, they have a title and a body and we can annotate both these properties with the add trim wrapper. And then if we are to set these properties with strings that are that have leading or trailing spaces, they will be automatically removed. This way we won't have to worry against setting uh, a bad value with, uh, with a subtle character that messes up all of a parsing logic. Everything will be handled by the wrapper. And we can find also other use cases, so for instance, data versioning. So we are going to this time implement an entire business requirement for property wrapper. So we are going to implement a wrapper that will manage an history of the values assigned to a given variable. So for instance, if you work on server side, it may be very useful if you need to debug or write to, to a log all the history at a value uh, that have been set to a value because it can really help you understand what went wrong if a bug happens. So we are going to implement this wrapper called version and it's going to be a generic type because it's going, it is going to store values and inside its state we are going to store a value. So this is the current value and then there will be 
the history, so we call it timestamp value, and it's an array of tuples, and the tuples contain two values, the date at which the value was set, and then the actual value. So, as it's a wrapper, we need to implement a wrap value. So the getter is pretty simple, we just return the current value, and when we are setting a new value, well, we set it inside the wrapper, and then we append it inside the history with the current date. And so this way, with this wrapper, we are able to manage an history of the values set to a, to a given property. So for instance, let's imagine that we are implementing an app where we are dealing with expense reports. So these reports, they have a state, so they are submitted, received, approved, or denied. And with this add version property, we can manage a state of all the all the, the values that were set to the property. And this way, if we have an issue, we will be able to get some very comprehensive logs that will let us understand what happened in a much easier way than by just having the current state of the variable. Here we will have the state and its history. It can be pretty useful when debugging. And a real world backend application could go even further. So for instance, we could implement a wrapper called at audited. So this one would track which user read or wrote to a given variable. So once again, for backend application, this is something that is very useful and often even required as part of the software requirement. Now, there are still some limitations by this way of implementing business requirements. And the main one is that property wrappers, they cannot throw errors. So it makes some interesting use cases out of which, for instance, if we were able to throw errors, we could do things like implemented entire workflows where the setter could refuse a value if it did not obey some rules. So in the case of an expense report, once it had been approved, it could not go back to to the submitted state. Unfortunately, this is not yet possible, but still it might like give us some ideas in the future if property wrappers were to evolve. So for the moment, we've used property wrappers in the most basic way, meaning that the wrapper was storing some data and then implementing some business logic around it. Now we are going to go a state beyond and we are going to interact with existing APIs. And we are going to take a very commonly, very broadly known API, user defaults. So this example comes from the blog of uh, Antoine van der Lee, and which he wrote during the WDC, so which shows that this is a very like straightforward example. This is a use case that comes to mind very, very fast when you know about property wrappers. So user defaults, they are the, they are the basic uh, persistent data store on iOS that you can use in order to store some simple key value information. And uh, most of the time, we don't want to directly in our code interact with user default. We want to provide some intermediate API in order to have a better code base. And so a way to do it is to extend user default have an enum which will store all the keys that we want to store in the data store. And then for every one of those keys, we implement a computed variable. And in the setter and the getter, we are calling the API of user default in order to set and get the value. So this is very nice. It works very well, but it has one drawback is that you need to implement one computed variable per key that you want to store in the data store. And uh, it's really like it grows very fast, of course, and we don't want to have to write all of this boilerplate code. And uh, it's a shame that we have to write it because on the other hand, when we use the API, it's very clean, like we can do user default dot standard, then the name of the property, we set it to some value, it gets stored inside the data store, then we can retrieve it the same way. So we have very clean call sites, but we have a lot of boilerplate. And as you can imagine, this is the perfect use case for property wrappers. So we are going to implement one. And as you can see, it's pretty simple because it doesn't take a lot of line. So we call it user default. It's a generic type T because it can store anything. And inside its state, we are storing two constants. The first one is the key, 
that we are using to store and retrieve the data. And the second one is a default value. We have the init, which is member wise, so pretty simple. And then inside the wrap value, we implemented we implement it by inside the getter trying to retrieve the value for the key. Then when we retrieve one, we try to cast it as an instance of type T. And if either there were no value or the cast fail, we return the default value. And inside the setter, we set the new value for the key in the data, data store. So with this, we can now implement user defaults in a much nicer way because we don't have to implement a new computed property for every new value that we want to store. We just have to declare a static variable, annotate it with user default, provide to the wrapper the kit we want to use and a default value, and that's it. We are now able to use it inside our app and it's going to behave as expected. So that's pretty cool because as you can see, before we used to store values inside the wrapper, now we are storing the means to retrieve the value, meaning the means to interact with an API. <coughs> so here I took the example of user default because it's the most famous that I store in iOS, but uh, it's an approach that could basically be applied to any other data store or any other API. So it's a very interesting approach. Now, just want to make a remark is that, as we've said, property wrappers, they operate on properties. So you might be thinking, yeah, that's very obvious that the whole point of property wrappers. But we might be thinking, ah, wouldn't it be cool if we also had the same mechanism for function? So it doesn't exist, but still, we know one thing is that Swift is a language that supports the functional paradigm. And it means that functions are first, first class citizens in Swift. So what does it mean really? It means three things. It means that we can store function in variables, function can take function as arguments, and function can also return function. So when we think about it, we know that we can store function in properties because we can do it, for instance, with closures. So if we can store a function into a property, then in a way, property wrappers, they can work with functions. So we are going to see what it means and what can be implemented this way. So we are going to start with something simple. We are going to have a look at caching the results of pure functions. So just a quick word on what is a pure function. It's a function that performs no side effects and returns always the same value for a given argument. So think about mathematical functions, things like uh, exponential, exponentials, factorials, etc. They are all pure functions. Okay, so if you want to implement a wrapper to cache the result of a pure function, you can see it's a little bit of code, so we are going to take it little by little. So we begin by just giving the header for the struct, so we are going to call it cached is going to have two generic arguments, the input of the function and its output. We have one requirement of the input that it must be hashable because we are going to store, to have some kind of uh, key value store that will require the input to be hashable in order to be able to be stored inside the, the store in a, in a way where we can retrieve it with a small complexity. Then we are going to store inside a function with a caching logic added. We will have an init. So the init will take the raw function and then it will add a caching logic to it with the static function called add caching logic that we are going to focus on just a little bit later. And then we are going to have this wrap value and the static function. So the wrap value, pretty simple. When we are retrieving it, we are just retrieving the function with the added cache that we are storing inside the wrapper. The setter, so when we are setting a new function, we do just like in the init, we add the caching logic and then we store it inside the wrapper. So it all boils down, it all boils down to this add caching logic function. So let's have a look at it and we are going to see that it's actually simpler than it looks like. So it takes a function and it, it returns a function. 
it takes a function from input to out output and returns a function from input to output. So as we can already like infer, it's going to take a function, add some behavior to it, and then return the new and upgraded function. So inside this function, we have a local variable called cache. So it's a dictionary from input to output. And then we are returning a function. So this function that we are returning takes an input, so we write it. And we are now performing the caching logic. And it's actually pretty simple because we just look inside the cache to see if there is already something stored for the current input. If so, we return it. And if not, we just carry out the computation, store the result in the cache, and then return the result. So that's it. There was a little bit more code than before, but not that much actually. And we saw that the caching logic was actually pretty straightforward. And now we can use this add cache. So for instance, here I am writing code that uses trigonometric functions, so the cosine. And uh, I have the cosine function, but I add this add cache things, which makes it that now when I try to calculate a cosine, the first time that I try to calculate the cosine of a given argument, so for instance, q pi, is going to actually run the computation, so it takes some time. But now the result has been cached, and if I call the function again with the same argument, it will be much faster to return the result. Here we can see that we have gained two orders of magnitude, and the very interesting thing is that usually, when we try to optimize our code, we tend to degrade its readability. But here it wasn't the case. We just added this add cache wrapper and that's it. We gained a behavior that allowed us to optimize our code. So pretty interesting approach, as you can see. And add cache is a very good example to understand how property wrappers and function can work together, but we can implement a lot of other use cases. We could implement a lot of other use cases, for instance, Everything that deals with timing, so like delaying and debouncing the execution of a function, you can implement it with a wrapper. You could also have a wrapper called at thread safe, which would basically wrap the execution of a piece of code around a lock or any other mechanism that makes sure that the code is indeed thread safe, etc. We can see that there are lots of use cases. And finally, I want to show you one last use case, which is more experimental but still interesting because it's going to allow us to like tie things with the first example I've shown you of Kotlin code. So Kotlin they are able to implement every network call using annotation. Now in Swift we're not there yet because we cannot like compose property wrappers together, we cannot annotate arguments. So we don't, couldn't realistically implement something like add post because it requires to have lots of arguments in order to make sense. But we can still implement a simpler version in order to see that it is possible. So we are going to implement get HTTP calls instead. Okay, so let's begin. First, we are going to define a type alias called service. So it's a generic type alias because the service has a response. And as you can see, it's an alias to a function that takes a completion handler this completion handler receives a reason that is either the response or an error. So I'm defining this alias because as you can see, the syntax for completion handlers in function signatures is a little bit messy and it's going to make things much easier to read. Then we start implemented the wrapper called get. So inside state, we are just storing a URL because in the most simple use case, this is what you need in order to make a get HTTP call. So we have an init, the init takes a string and we try to parse it to a URL. We do a force and what because as I said, this is experimental. So we don't want to deal with the error. We just want to crash if there is an error. This way the code will be easier and more like focused for you to understand it easily. And then we implement the wrapped value. So this wrapped value, it's a service. So as you can imagine, inside the computed property, we are going to generate the function that performs the network call. So we only have a getter because it doesn't make sense to set something. We are generating a function. So we said we are returning a service. So okay, let's return a service. So a service is a function that takes a completion handler, so we write it. And then 
inside the function. So we create a data task using URL session. We give this data task the URL that is stored inside the wrapper. And then inside the callback of the data task, we first check to see if there is an error. If there were an error, if there was an error, we propagate it to the completion handler through the result by giving the result an, a failure value. If there wasn't an error, meaning that there is some actual data, we parse it as a UTF-8 string. Once again, I'm doing a lot of force and wrap in order to not deal with errors and keep the code simple. And once the string has been decoded, we give it to the completion handler through the result, this time with the success value. And finally, we don't forget to actually start the task. And with this, we've implemented the add get property wrapper, which given a URL is able to synthesize the network call, the network code needed to perform the call. So we could use it. Here we are going to use it to call the Open Weather Map API. So this URL it returns a static JSON file which is used for demo purposes. So I'm using the at get wrapper. I give it the URL. I just declare the variable, so giving it a name and a type. As you can see, I'm not implementing anything because the implementation is going to be generated by the wrapper. And indeed, when I use the variable, I go through the getter of the wrap value where everything is implemented. And if I am to print it, to print the result to the console, I will see that I am indeed getting the result of an HTTP call. So it's interesting because it shows that we can still implement some powerful stuff with property wrappers. Now, I would warn you that uh, this last part about network calls, it is more like experimental to show you just how far we can get. I wouldn't recommend that you use it inside your application because we cannot implement the whole range of HTTP call in a nice way with property wrappers. So you are better off sticking with protocol oriented programming for this. But still, it shows that there is a lot of power under the hood and this ability to generate functions given the argument provided to the wrapper. It has a lot of interesting use cases that I'm sure you will find in your app. So it's almost the end of the talk, so it's time to recap. So what did we see in this talk? Well, first, we talked about property wrappers, of course, and we saw that there are a new construct in Swift that let us wrap properties with custom behavior. We saw that they are extremely good at removing boilerplate. Think about the example with user default. I'm sure you've all used it. You've all had to write a lot of user default, uh, a lot of boilerplate to interact with user default. With property wrappers, this is now part of the past. You no longer need to write this boilerplate. And what's really interesting is that you don't need to introduce some external tool like code generation or anything else. You are doing all of this in Swift in your project in a very like um, consistent manner. We also saw that they provide some great ergonomics for ubiquitous const constructs. So meaning that when you use a property wrapper, it works in a very seamless way. And uh, this is nice because when there is a, constru a construct that makes sense everywhere inside your app, if you can use a wrapper to just not have to explicitly use it to explicitly implement it all the time, it makes things easier. We saw that property wrappers, even though they are called property wrappers, they can actually be applied on function and it opens the way to a lot of interesting use cases. We saw the example of caching functions, for instance, uh, but it can also be used with things that deal with the UI, so like delaying or debouncing some handlers. So there is a lot of potential there. But I want you to also think that property wrappers, they are kind of like uh, overloaded operators in the sense that they can really hurt code readability if they are abused. So you should think about it a lot when you are about to introduce a wrapper, just like when you are about to introduce an overloaded operator to say like, am I going to use it everywhere inside my app in a very consistent manner? Is it going to make sense to the other people reading my code that I am using this wrapper? And if you are like hesitant or not sure whether the wrapper will 
bring something valuable to your code base, maybe you're better off not using them because they are powerful tools and uh, with great power comes great responsibility. So you should think about it before you introduce a reader to a code base. And finally, we can guess that uh, since there are so much possibilities for party wrappers, they will probably open the way to some new exciting frameworks. Today, like Swift UI and Combine, they already rely a lot on wrappers, but uh, in the future, we can definitely imagine that some third party frameworks will also rely a lot on them in order to provide some features that, we'll, that we will be able to use in a very seamless, declarative, and basically uh, Swifty way in our code. So that's it for this talk. Thank you all for coming. So I think there will be a Q&A session afterward. But uh, anyway, if you want to reach me, you have my Twitter handle. So you can ask me any question that, uh, that you want. I will post the slide uh, pretty soon on my GitHub and I will put a link on the Twitter account. So if you want to, to get the slide, you'll be able to get them on the Twitter account in, uh, in a few hours. Thank you all and uh, have a good day.